Hi, this is Tom from zero to finals.com. In this video, I'm going to be going through common foot problems. And you can find written notes on this topic at zero to finals.com slash foot problems or in the orthopedic surgery section of the zero to finals surgery book. So let's jump straight in. Let's start by talking about plantar fasciitis. Plantar fasciitis is inflammation of the plantar fascia. The plantar fascia is made up of thick connective tissue. It attaches to the calcaneus at the heel, travels along the sole of the foot and branches out to connect to the flexor tendons of the toes. The presentation of plantar fasciitis is with a gradual onset of pain in the plantar aspect of the foot, on the bottom of the foot. This is worse with pressure, particularly when walking or standing for prolonged periods. There is tenderness to palpation of this area, particularly where the plantar fascia attaches to the calcaneus, just below the heel of the foot. Management involves rest, ice, analgesia, for example, non anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs, physiotherapy and steroid injections. Steroid injections can be very painful and rarely they can cause rupture of the plantar fascia or a condition called fat pad atrophy. Fat pad atrophy affects the fat pad over the heel of the foot which is under the calcaneus bone. The fat pad normally protects the heel from impact. Rarely, specialist management of plantar fasciitis may be required with extracorporeal shockwave therapy or surgery. Next, let's talk about fat pad atrophy. Fat pad atrophy affects the fat pad over the heel of the foot which is under the calcaneus bone. The fat pad normally protects the heel from impact. Atrophy, which means wasting away of the fat pad, can occur with age or inflammation from repetitive impacts such as jumping activities, running, walking and obesity. Local steroid injections into the heel of the foot, which can be used to treat plantar fasciitis, can cause fat pad atrophy. Symptoms are similar to plantar fasciitis, with pain and tenderness over the plantar aspect of the heel. Symptoms are worse with activities, particularly when barefoot on hard surfaces. The thickness of the fat pad can be measured using an ultrasound scan. Management involves comfortable shoes, custom insoles, adapting activities, for example, avoiding high heels, and weight loss if appropriate. Next, let's talk about Morton's neuroma. Morton's neuroma refers to the dysfunction of a nerve in the intermetatarsal space between the toes, towards the top of the foot. The abnormal nerve is usually located between the third and the fourth metatarsal, It's caused by irritation of the nerve relating to the biomechanics of the foot. As the foot's moving during activities, it irritates the nerve. Wearing high heels or narrow shoes may exacerbate the problem because they squeeze the metatarsals together, irritating the nerve further. Typical symptoms are pain at the front of the foot at the location of the lesion, the sensation of a lump in the shoe, and a burning, numbness or pins and needles sensation felt in the distal toes. There are several ways to test for Morton's neuroma. Applying deep pressure to the affected intermetatarsal space on the dorsal foot, on the back of the foot, will cause pain with a Morton's neuroma. There's a special test called metatarsal squeeze test, which involves squeezing the forefoot with one hand to create a concave shape to the plantar aspect of the foot, making a hollow shape with the bottom of the foot. 
and then using the other hand to press the affected area on the bottom or the plantar side of the foot. And this will cause pain in a Morton's neuroma. Finally, there's Mulder's sign, which is a painful click that's felt when you use two hands on either side of the foot to manipulate the metatarsal heads in order to rub the neuroma. An ultrasound or MRI scan can be used to confirm the diagnosis of a Morton's neuroma. Management options include adapting activity, for example, avoiding high heels, analgesia with non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs if they're suitable, insoles, weight loss if appropriate, steroid injections can be used. And there's the option of radiofrequency ablation or surgery. And surgery can involve excising or removing the neuroma. Next, let's talk about bunions. The medical name for bunions is hallux valgus. Hallux refers to the big toe and valgus refers to the angle of the deformity. A bunion is a bony lump that's created by a deformity at the metatarsophalangeal joint or MTP joint at the base of the big toe. The first metatarsal becomes angled medially towards the inside of the foot. The big toe or the hallux becomes angled laterally towards the other toes and the MTP joint becomes inflamed and enlarged. This creates a bony lump at the base of the big toe. Over time, additional stress on the joint can result in osteoarthritis. Bunions develop slowly. The cause is not clear and they can become painful, particularly when walking and wearing tight shoes. Weight-bearing x-rays can be used to assess the extent of the deformity. Conservative management is with wide, comfortable shoes and analgesia. Patients can use bunion pads to protect the bunion from the inside of their shoes. Surgery is the definitive treatment for bunions. There are several options depending on individual factors. The aim is to realign the bones and correct the deformity. The final common foot problem to cover is gout. Gout is a common cause of pain and swelling in the metatarsophalangeal joint or MTP joint at the base of the big toe. It can also affect the wrist, ankle, base of the thumb or the knee. Gout is a type of crystal arthropathy that's associated with chronically high blood levels of uric acid. Urate crystals collect in the joint causing it to become acutely hot, swollen and painful. A diagnosis of gout is usually made clinically it's essential to exclude septic arthritis, which is a potentially very dangerous differential diagnosis. In order to exclude septic arthritis, joint fluid aspiration may be required. Aspirated fluid in gout will show no bacterial growth because there's no infection, needle-shaped crystals, and these will be negatively birefringent of polarised light and the crystals will be made of monosodium urate. Management during the acute flare of gout is with non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, for example ibuprofen, which are used first line. Colchicine is a second line option, and steroids can be used third line. Allopurinol is a xanthane oxase inhibitor used for the prophylaxis of gout in order to prevent gout and it does this by reducing the uric acid levels in the blood. 
Lifestyle changes can also reduce the risk of developing gout, and this involves losing weight, staying hydrated, and minimizing the consumption of alcohol and purine-based foods, such as meat and seafood. A Tom tip for you, do not initiate allopurinol prophylaxis until after the acute attack has settled. Starting allopurinol can cause or worsen an attack of gout. When a patient is already using allopurinol, they can continue taking it during further acute episodes. If you like this video, consider joining the Zero to Finals Patreon account, where you get early access to these videos before they appear on YouTube. You also get access to my comprehensive course on how to learn medicine and do well in medical exams, digital flashcards for rapidly testing the key facts you need for medical exams, early access to the Zero to Finals podcast episodes, and question podcasts which you can use to test your knowledge on the go. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.